Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Offroad. I'm your host, Doug. Caleb is back with me again. Caleb, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. I'm actually really excited for today because we've got a pretty awesome interview that, uh, man, if, uh, I'm not going to spoil it. I'll let you go ahead and intro to this in, but I'm excited. This is going to be an incredible episode, <laughs> and um, definitely one you guys do not want to miss. Well, dude, you should be excited because as I kind of teased this last week, and I think I even talked about it in the mailbag based on some things that were going on in the world of social media, we kind of decided to pull an audible here and go with a kind of a recovery based Mm -hmm. episode, just based on some of the stuff that's going around social media right now. And, you know, kind of making it wanting it to be timely and get out there at the right time. We, we were fortunate enough to get Justin Andrews from factor 55 and Warren um get him to agree to come on our little podcast that nobody watches and talk about recovery and why it's important and all that kind of stuff and and we'll get into that more later but yeah we've got him we're gonna go after that so uh yeah without further ado everybody let's uh let's get this podcast rolling when other people see dirt you see glory And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt Dirt to Dust. Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right, welcome back. So let's get this thing going here. As promised, we do have Mr. Justin Andrews from Factor 55 and Warren, uh, Justin, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing today? Doing great, guys. Thanks for uh, thanks for hitting me up, Doug. Thanks, Caleb, for uh, you know in, uh, inviting me on the show, man. So, uh, super excited, man, to help uh, support you, dudes, and and to be here to uh, discuss uh, all you know, kind of the hot topics circling around the internet right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, no kidding. Like I said, we are we are super excited to have you. So on. I've I, Justin, you and I have known each other for for quite a while, for several years now. But for those who kind of don't know who, I mean, we all know you as the vest, which is weird. You're not wearing the vest today, but we all know you as the vest. But you know, tell me, talk a little bit about just kind of background before we kind of dive into all this stuff. You know, how'd you how'd you get into this? How'd you get with Factor Fifty Five, Warren? Just what got you into the off-road industry and to where you're at now? Yeah, so it's kind of a funny, uh, funny, interesting story there. Um, I was actually uh, teaching scuba um, in uh, Hawaii and was uh, working as a dive instructor, working on boats and and doing that stuff. And um, I I went to I actually went to college for music, uh, played in a band, uh, was on tour, um, did that for a number of years, and then when it got to uh, in '08 when the market crashed. Um, I had moved back to California where my son was living and then was like, just looking for a job, ended up, uh, working, um, uh, teaching scuba and working at a bunch of dive shops and stuff before I ended up moving back to Idaho. Uh, and then when I moved back to Idaho, I bought a Jeep and I was like, initially, you know, getting into this, I was like, you know what, man, I'm going to take the doors off and go camping and be a cool guy and like the whole thing. And it was, and it was actually one of the bars, <laughs> um, that I used to work in. Uh, the, the guy that, I, um, that was our, uh, bouncer, right door guy and you know, chicken IDs and stuff at the door. Um, turns out he was a jeeper and I didn't really know that. Right. I didn't know that about him, even being friends with this dude for forever. And when I first told him that I had bought, uh, this four door JK, he was like, Hey man, you ever heard of King of the hammers? And I was like, no, nah, man, like that sounds crazy. And like, never at that time did I ever think, you know, going on 12 years ago that I was going to go to King of the hammers every year for like the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Like it was like so hilarious. And so we, um, we went out from like, uh, you know, I got involved in, uh, you know, I'm kind of obsessive. So when I get into something, I really just get into it. Um, we ended up starting the largest, uh, off-road club in the state of Idaho and then started doing, going to events, um, you know, hosting trail runs, trying to learn all the legal places that we could go wheeling and have access to a lot of the public land that we have out here, um, in the, in the state of Idaho. Um, 
And then that led me to, at some point, you know, you're looking online and going through this whole thing and you're looking for a, how can you learn and be better about the thing that you're passionate about or into. And so I would start seeing um, like the pro link, the original shackle mount kind of pop up on like some of the Terraflex builds or gen or, you know what I mean? Kind of around the internet. And I was like, well, those guys clearly are pros at what they're doing and I want to be a pro. So I looked into, uh, you know, it was like factor 55 Boise, Idaho. Like I live here. Right. And that's when, uh, I, uh, initially went down and, and, uh, met Mike, uh, and you know, who was the founder of factor 55 and he was about six months into starting, uh, the business at that time. And, you know, six months after that fact, uh, you know, he hired me and I was like the first employee there. Uh, and been there the longest. Holy crap. So it was kind of a, <laughs> just kind of a whole thing of how it all like met together. So it was from wheeling that, you know, that directed me towards like the infancy of that brand. Um, and then allowed me to be able to kind of take the reins of that and, you know, and build it up to what it, what it is right now. For sure. It's pretty cool. Now you said you wanted to be professional. Was uh, the idea of recovery, was that just more opportunistic for you? That was just the fact that it was something in the, the Jeep world that you're like, hey, that looks pretty cool. Or was recovery something you're like, ooh, I really want to learn about that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was it was kind of it was kind of both. Okay. Um, I, you know, initially, you know, you're trying to find guys at the time, like Facebook and Instagram and all these things were not really platforms that we're using, mm -hmm. especially the way that we're using and connecting with people uh, nowadays. And all of it was on the Jeep forum, mm -hmm. right? So, like one of the first trail rides I ever did, I met a guy. Uh, and his handle, uh, his uh, handle is Dog Man. This guy named John, and we met this dude at one of our local trails out here. And like I, I went from literally like pulling up, showing up, meeting this guy off of a off of a Jeep forum to like airing down tires and being like, "What are we doing? Like, how are we gonna put air back in the tires? Like, <laughs> we're all in the middle of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, I, I've magic. done it all." You know what I mean? I've literally done it from like, didn't even know how to change the oil in my vehicle mm -hmm. to now, you know, uh, being able to be involved in racing in Baja and King of the Hammers and all the things. So, I mean, it went from literally knowing absolutely nothing to wanting to know as much as I could. And, you know, I was the same thing. I put a winch on the front of my Jeep. I stuck my hook to my D ring and felt all badass. Like I was like the coolest dude ever. And, you know, and, and really what it came out of, it was the knowledge of wanting to, you know, it's just the wanting to gain the information. And trying to find guys that were more knowledgeable about it so I could understand how X, Y, and Z would work. And so vehicle recovery is inherent with everything that we do uh, when we go wheeling in the backcountry. And so it was just something that, uh, you know, I was kind of drawn to, I think, initially anyway, especially from my scuba instruction um, and doing that type of thing. And so it just, you know, it was kind of a natural kind of fit or progression. But really, man, if I had been living anywhere else where a company had an opportunity to where I could, you know, be involved in the off-road industry in any kind of way, I probably would be, you know, trying to focus my specialty into whatever it was. Like if Jeremy had lived, you know what I mean? If Rock Crawler was in my backyard, I would have tried to fight my <laughs> tooth and nail to go work there. Be working for right? Rock Crawler. Right. Or whatever. Right. It would have been, it would have been any kind of, I think it was just anything at that time and it just so happened to where. Um, this kind of uh, really fell in my lap and, you know, it was meant to be as, as they say. Yeah, that's awesome. And you go from not knowing how to change your oil to an <laughs> official worn racing athlete yeah, competing right, at King exactly. of the Hammers. And, that's right. Uh, that's pretty awesome. That is actually pretty awesome. And, and and I know you from that now. I mean, you know, we had met before that, but now, you know, we're out there racing together and you're racing with, with Sergio now in the 4655. And um, I know we're supposed to be we're probably supposed to not like each other, right? Like we're supposed to like <laughs> want to beat each other, right? No way, like, man. Is that, 46, a thing? is that what we're supposed 40, to do now? No, nah, man. Forty six hundred <laughs> is the is the spirit of Ultra Four, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's absolutely the, you know, love the, it so much. Yeah, yeah, man. It's I think it's really a testament to where it's one thing with big budgets and you know big race cars, but man, to take like, dude, like the Suzuki tribe, right? That shows up. That's, that's good so for awesome. them, dude. So awesome. It's the yeah. Yep. I mean, that's absolutely. literally the ultimate thing for them to show up and tow the line. And I think that that's part of the whole beauty. And after being out at King of the Hammers for 10 years, and then now finally being able to actually compete in it from last year and this year, uh, dream come true, right? I mean, all I've ever wanted to do is to uh, be a part of uh, something like this. And it's, uh, it's awesome, man. It's awesome to be working together and getting to know these guys better. And, you know, all the people we've supported uh, with product and in and, and R and D and development over the years, to now actually be involved in it. I mean, it's just the next level of what we're trying to do when it comes to 
um, rock crawling. And when it comes to being in off roading and jeeping and all the Absolutely. things, man, it kind of ties back to the uh, the R and D episode that Doug and I did um, a couple episodes ago. And like, you can't have incredible products without incredible R and D. And there's no more incredible R and D than King of the Hammers to see your products and the stuff that you push every day that you live and breathe being used on literally the world's toughest one day race. Um, I think that's says something about itself, and it's pretty freaking awesome. But Doug, this one's for you, man. Um, kind of going from and speaking about products, uh, what's the point of this episode? Why do we have Justin on today? What are we talking about today? Well, I, you know, I kind of touched on it a little bit. And, and for some people, a lot of people have seen this, this kind of going around social media recently. It seems like every year or so that we get some new and noteworthy story video some kind of happening out there in the world of off-road that is the new great story about how somebody almost died during a during a recovery and i think a couple years ago it was the unfortunate tale of the guy with the you know the trailer ball out in arizona i think it was ryan woods and and that was that was a right and that was a pretty clear cut this is what happened wrong like everybody knew everybody knew that that was and, and it really wasn't you know video going around but now we've got uh, the the other Caleb, we're just calling the other Caleb, and this incident out with mm-hmm. this Bronco, um, and the and the 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 TJ or LJ that was pulling them out, where we've now got it on video. The whole thing was shot. Uh, there was a lot of video of it, a lot of coverage on it, and we've actually had the driver who was pretty significantly injured has come out, done interviews. He's talked about. It, he's put himself out there, and kudos to him for that. Um, but you know, I watched that, I saw that, and as soon as I saw it, you know, we had. Caleb, you and I had mm-hmm. just talked about, hey, you know, we got to, you know, we got to get this list about who we have on the show. And I said, you know, this is this is the time to talk about recovery. This is the time to kind of hit on that incident a little bit. And we'll talk about it a little bit. I mean, I know a lot of people are talking about it, um, but just to talk about recovery and not really to go out there and say, oh, this is what this guy did wrong. But to say, well, this is why we do it this way. Um, not really to say what was done wrong, but maybe to say, well, this is what you know, that maybe this is what we would do differently, or this is what, you know, maybe a company would do differently or how it could have been differently. And I said, you know, that's why I kind of jumped on it. I sent Justin a message. I was like, look, I know this is kind of short notice. We don't generally say, Hey, can I interview you, you know, next week? (laughs) You know, we like to plan these things out. We like to know, you know, a month in advance when it's going to happen, but it was just so timely. And this was happening right now that I felt the need to kind of get this interview done and get this episode out. And honestly, you know, especially from the racing standpoint, we kind of talked about it a little bit. You know, we use Factor 55 and worn on 4699. I've always used it on personal rigs. We've been, we've had a very, very tight connection there between Outlaw Off-Road and Warren, between Outlaw Off-Road and Factor 55 for several years. And so it just made sense to reach out to Justin and be like, oh, that's, you know, you obviously know this, you eat, live, sleep, mm-hmm. breathe this stuff. Let's get it on here and talk about it for 45 minutes. And it, it just made yeah, sense absolutely. to do it. So he was gracious enough to say yes. And, uh, and awesome. here we are. Well, like I said, that's a uh, man. I, and I did see that video and it's, it's kind of scary to watch because something like that can happen to just about anyone. If, if, you know, all products have a failure point at some point. Um, and uh, it's just, it's hard to watch that kind of stuff as someone who has been in probably dangerous situations, very similar, uh, or even more dangerous situations that I got a lucky break and nothing snapped or broke or anything like that. So, um, but going from that point into, and I get, we're not going to talk about what was wrong or, you know, cause he already did interviews and everything on that. But, uh, so what makes factor 55 products different and how do we know what they're capable of withstanding? Yeah. So a lot of the stuff that, I mean, one of the things that we really forefronted as a brand was we were one of the very first uh, companies to actually not only provide, you know, um, working load limits or uh, minimum braking strengths on all the products that we offer to release. But we were also the first company to put out um, actual video evidence and complete transparency mm-hmm. of the destructive testing that mm-hmm. we do. So it wasn't just like, Hey man, when I say that this breaks a 40,000 pounds, I'm not just wagging the number. Like here's the proof. Like now in every single product that you buy from us, every single uh, shackle mount, every soft shackle, everything, any piece of equipment that you get from Factor 55 comes with a copy of that certificate of the destructive test in the package. So not only can you reference all of our social media, 
our YouTube channel, all these things, whenever we do this type of um, testing, we're completely transparent about it. Um, a good example was like one of our brand new products that we just released at King of the Hammers um, that is going to be coming up to be finally like, you know, available, like kind of everywhere here shortly uh, being the hammer loop, which is a, the integrated soft shackle that goes into the ultra hook uh, was specifically designed for, you know, the racing purposes in mind. Right. So again, there goes that R and D level from doing it as, as safe and as fast as possible. But like, even when we destructively tested those, and as we start to release this information, the minimum braking strength of that particular product um, is 27,000, like 800 pounds. Mm -hmm. Right. And we made, you know, we, we made 10 of them. We put them in the test bed. Uh, we ramped them up. We pulled them, pulled them, pulled them, pulled them. Six of the 10 broke above 32,000 pounds. Right. And then two of them broke right at about 30. Uh, there was one that broke at like 29, nine. And then there's the one outlier that broke at 27, eight. So we're not taking an average mm -hmm. of numbers we're taking the minimum braking strength that we saw out of this material based on its design and capability. And that's the number that gets put on this. So, you know, yeah. the absolute minimum braking strength of what that uh, part could go. Cause dude, I could wag it and easily say, ah, it's 30,000 pounds, whatever. I could just blindly put a number on there or, or even try to put like uh, where you've seen other companies try to refer to a maximum braking strength, which is something to totally avoid. Uh, Big but difference. yeah, but to have that go out there, like, here's the number, here's why. And then we'll have a whole thing about, uh, especially for all the new people that are still discovering our brand, um, you know, of a reason why of how we do the testing and why we do the testing and why it matters and why it's so important. And, uh, you know, in this particular situation, um, with this uh, life threatening situation that Caleb got into, you know, I mean, he learned it the hard way and luckily is able to tell the tale afterwards. But I mean, there's a, you know, it's, sure. it's, it's like, it's like something I heard a long time ago, which was uh, a cheap tattoo, uh, a good tattoo ain't cheap, a cheap tattoo ain't good. <laughs> right. Right. And that's what it is, man. You know, there's a, something to be said when it comes to material properties uh, and the reliability of manufacturing, um, you know, especially from reputable brands. And uh, it's a big key difference that has always separated us um, from the fray. Right. And we've been doing it longer um, than most companies that are out there and have always continued to charge forward for uh, better products, product development, listening to the customer, and uh, really trying to produce um, the best possible products that we can uh, into the market space. Yeah, for sure. And that's actually another thing that Doug and I touched on the other week, um, that something that goes into the final cost is actually the material, material used, um, whereas overseas you've got you don't know how much steel, you don't know how much carbon, like it's just, it's kind of a, a toss up. Uh, and whereas U S generally has minimum standards, uh, and I'm sure you guys have standards on the billet you use and the type of machinery you use to cut that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We use, yeah, we have, we have material lot traceability on top of all of the billet aluminum that we machine our parts off of, cause it's all comes from, uh, Kaiser's foundry, uh, in Washington state. Um, and so we have lot traceability on the aluminum that comes out of there because we sell to the government and it's life mm -hmm. safety stuff, right? Um, it's the same thing even when it comes to uh, the actual fibers that we use either from the American Webbing Institute um, when it comes to um, some of the polyester fibers for our uh, uh, slings and toe straps. Uh, and then all the way down to the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene that a lot of our soft shackles and synthetic um, soft goods are made out of is the same thing as uh, direct lot traceability that's coming from uh, Cortland USA or any major um, fiber uh, companies. Uh, so we have total tracing from start to finish. Uh, and that's even the same reason why, like I can even show you an example here with like on one of our uh, standard duty soft shackles. So like one of the things that's even on here is that you'll see that there's actually an individual serial number wow. on every single product that we manufacture. Mm -hmm. And so that, yep. that can be traced down literally to the desk of the person that assembled that soft shackle and put that thing together. So if there's any kind of problem in um, the splicing or the manufacturing yeah. of that product, that you literally can look up that number, get to the day, and literally get to the workstation of the person that assembled it. Uh, and so that's, I mean, that's the care and the level that we're putting into everything that we, we manufacture. And just so you guys know, it's, th you know what I mean? It's thousands of parts, right? It's thousands of parts a month that we're having to go through like to do this with. 
but at the end of the day, it's all for uh, safety and reliability um, and, and making sure that people are going to have the best experience possible when utilizing these products in whatever situation that you, they may be in. See, and that, you know, Caleb mentioned it. We talked about this during the R&D episode. And, and Justin, we talked about this a little bit off camera before we started filming. It was about the destructive testing. And still, to my knowledge, Factor 55 is the only one out there doing destructive testing. I mean, you're actually breaking stuff to test it. And, you know, we talked about, you know, I made mention of Next Venture Motorsports doing that with their bumper and their armor that we, you know, I can appreciate that. And when you're putting stuff, deliberately putting your product in harm's way so that you can know that you know that you know when this is going to be damaged, when this is going to break, when this is going to, you know, when this is going to reach its limit. And, you know, again, when we talk about that, the Bronco incident with that Jeep, I mean, it was pretty clear, you know, when you watch the video, you see the Jeep back up and and we can certainly have the conversation about kinetic ropes and he backed up too far. Okay. I get all of that, but he went into some amount of detail talking about the soft shackle that he had Bronco side that was on. And I think it was on a metal cloak bumper. I thought I saw the metal cloak logo there. Um, which was on the Bronco side. And then on the Jeep side, it was a soft shackle that was directly put on to um, a, a recovery point. Okay, great. That shouldn't have been done. Okay. We all know that now. And the soft shackle was hooked up properly on the Bronco side. But when you see the damage that was done to that bumper on that Bronco at that, it warped the steel and pulled that thing, how much force that had to take. And that factor 55 South shackle held up. That just tells you right there, you know, it, it's no surprise to you, Justin. I know you're like, Oh yeah, we, we know, we know how much that's going to take, but to your average off-road enthusiast, you know, that's a huge difference and is very easy to be able to look side by side at product and go, well, this is one that was tested. We already knew that was going to work. That's no surprise to us. That's not arrogance. That's R and D. And to know yeah, that and to have that confidence that's man. That's what separates. Well, absolutely. That's what so separates of, a lot of companies. So one sure. of the things, just for clarification, right through there, is that the soft shackle that was on the Bronco end was not ours, right? It is. I will okay. say this. So our all of our um, synthetic goods are manufactured at an industrial marine rigging facility in Texas. Now, the reason why we do that is because mm. the amount of uh, like we built machine parts, right? And so we weren't we. We, we weren't, and I would say, even argue to say that we still are not cordage experts, right? The people that really live in that, that's not, that was never our area, but we kept on getting asked so many times over the years to be, you know, a one-stop shopper to offer the best quality parts that we could to where people could buy them. And so in order for us to be able to do that, we, as Mike, our company founder, uh, is a mechanical engineer, went to Cal State Fullerton, worked for Ford Aerospace, worked for Lamb Research, it was always this av avid Toyota rock crawler. Like, dude, he was wheeling a Rubicon back in the early 80s with Chris Collard from Overland Journal and right in the Off-Road Hall of Fame, <laughs> Steve Sasaki from Power Tank, and all these guys right back, you know, with this wadded up beer can Toyota trucks. I mean, Mike, uh, and dude, and if you think about like the prowess of the, in, the, in, in this dude is like, you know, like he, we're talking about the early 80s and he's going into hot rod shops to find out other gear ratios and information to run bigger tires then, right? And thinking about what he was going to do to narrow a Dana 60 and narrow a Dana 70 to put it under his 83 Hilux. You know what I'm saying? Because that's how much into it he was even back then. He has one of the original Marlin crawler uh, dual transfer cases that Marlin wow. actually signed that's in that truck. Jeez. I mean, it's, it's, it's the history oh, that's there is so awesome, right? So when you think about, like, the amount of push and the ingenuity that is in that guy, uh, when we came in and starting to develop what we were going to do when it came to uh, use and product availability, uh, you know, we wanted to find the absolute best manufacturing capability that we could uh, when it came to this. And plus on the scale of it all, right? Uh, making a soft shackle is not rocket science for, for the most part. Uh, but what it does take is it does take precision and it takes knowledge and to repeat that over and over and over again. And it takes anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes given the person to create a perfectly spliced put together soft shackle. And then they got to be uh, proof load tested and blah, blah, blah. I mean, do, I mean, it goes down the line. And so we utilize this facility to manufacture those goods to our spec in order to provide the best uh, products and availability 
uh, out into the marketplace without having to also hire like literally hundreds of people, dude. Because if you think it takes 10 minutes an average to build a soft shackle correctly, well, now you can only make five an hour, right? You see what I'm saying? You just start multiplying that per hour per day. And, you know, let me give you, let me give you this example. Um, we sold last year, um, you know, tons of recovery kits just to Rivian, the, ele- the electric truck company, right? And there's two, and there's, so there's, so we, we OE a recovery kit to Rivian. So there's two soft shackles in each one of those recovery kits, right? You times that by however many, you know what I mean? By the, like the, the hundreds, the thousands that they buy, like, dude, it's, it's just labor, right? And, and that's a, that's a thing that really gets us to a place that we can uh, continue to rely on, you know, r- quality manufacturing, just like we do with the quality manufacturing, the billet machine parts that we make and know that we're going to get those uh, serial numbers and produced parts and do these things. Cause this, this company works with, you know, huge businesses in the oil industry and, you know, I mean, like way outside of off road. Um, so that being said, uh, the soft shekel that was used uh, was made at that facility. Um, it just was underneath a different brand name. Right. But that's, it's because the barrier to entry in the synthetic goods market is so low that's where you're getting so much misinformation put out into the market space. And that I think is the hardest thing that puts people's lives in danger because they're like, well, I can go on Amazon, right? I can buy this soft shackle for 25 bucks. And it looks just like this soft shackle that says USA made that's, you know, twice the money. So why would I spend 50 bucks when I can spend 25 bucks? Well, clearly we just got a video outline that just happened that shows exactly the reason why. Because of material properties, density of fibers per strand. I mean, there are all of these different things when you really get down to a, the, you know, the polymer base of how the soft shack was created and put together. And really, can you trust those load factors? Caleb even brought up on the fact that like the website uh, or on the Amazon listing for the soft shackle that did fail um, in this recovery scenario, that there was, um, it had two different load ratings. So which one are you supposed to trust? Which one are you supposed to know which, where it's supposed to go to or how, how to function to do that? Or other companies were like, again, none of our equipment was used in this scenario. I think that had he used our equipment in this scenario, the outcome would have been much different, right? Um, but uh, the other thing is, I think that um, uh, with, the, with those Amazon-style uh, imported goods, there's just zero reliability there. And you don't know... Um, what type of, you know, what type of material it was made out of, whether it was, you know, uh, SK-75, SK, you know, uh, SK-99, any of these other types of Dyneema fibers that get put together. Was it plasma? Was it spectra? Was it, you know what I mean? All these different things when you get into the cordage and the rope world, I mean, who knows? And somebody just blindly put a load rating on the side of that thing. Uh, and, you know, uh, a consumer is going to think, hey, man, I'm going to be good to go here. And it turns out that he wasn't. Right. right. And it's well, real. There's the accountability. Like, what are you yeah, going to do if somebody who, who are you going to get mad at if your Amazon soft shackle breaks? Like, where's <laughs> yeah, exactly. the accountability? And it's really interesting to see, you know, in, in two scenarios, like one, I had a customer one time that called us because they had used one of our extreme duty soft shackles, which looks like this. Right. And so the extreme duty soft shackle uh, has a, a polyester jacket and whipped around the outside of it. So it can really deal with mm-hmm. abrasion a lot better. Um, but they were recovering a, um, a, a motorhome that had slid off camera off the side of the road. And the only place that they at the time could had stuck the soft shackle through to connect to this motorhome was through the wheel, right? It was like through the steel wheel, like the peak, the classic circle pizza cutter, little wheel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as they pulled the guy back up on the road and the wheel began to rotate, well, it just sliced right through the soft shackle, right? Even with the protective jacket on, because it's like literally, you know, putting all that load and force on that one little point and just slice straight through it. And so they called yep. us asking about a warranty. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> you shouldn't have put it on the sharp <laughs> wheel. Like, what were you thinking? <laughs> right. But the, and I think that a lot of things when we talk about vehicle recovery is a good point to this is, did it save that motorhome? Absolutely. Did everybody go and walk away from it? A hundred percent. Then maybe you should talk to that person about replacing your $80 soft shackle instead of the $2,000 tow bill that they would have got had they tried to call a tow truck, right? So, you know, it was clearly a misused situation, but if it it ended up resulting in the outcome, that's why these things are consumable. You know what I mean? 
all synthetic goods, all straps, just like our tires, just, you know what I mean? Bushings in our control arms, things have got to get replaced over time. It's not, it's not a last forever thing. It's a consumable product. And so can you sacrifice it in order to have the best possible outcome? Absolutely. And so that's, I think, a big thing that needs to be addressed, I think, a lot more, you know, because every recovery scenario is different, weather, terrain, you know, and, uh, and it's inherently dangerous, right? And especially if you're using untested, unrated gear, then you're not only putting yourself in danger, but all of those people that are around you. And, uh, you know, again, I think it's just so much of over the last, you know, decade and, and being on the forefront of involvement in this, uh, again, the barrier to entry is just, you know, is much easier than it used to be to get in there. And if you guys remember, I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but, you know, going all the way back to SEMA, like, geez, going on like eight or nine years ago, um, Bubba Rope released uh, the Gator Draw Soft Shackle. And it won the best new product in four-wheel drive at that time. And, uh, you know, Mike and I had always thought that it was kind of interesting because Soft Shackle has been used in the in the marine industry for 100 years. And so this is the first time a company had actually introduced something to bring it into the off-road space. Well, we were the first brand to even introduce soft shackles to be used out at King of the Hammers. So we used to sell all of Bubba Rope equipment. In fact, Bubba Rope actually used to make our toe straps and our tree savers uh, for us. So that was a whole thing. Like we we had always worked in and supported them and and to do that. Now, um, I think in, in one end, uh, some of the marketing uh, taglines and some of the branding also um, pushed this narrative of uh, of that they were safer than steel shackles or that they were you know stronger than that and I think that there was a little bit of that because you know as a newbie or as a as just a person and you know trying to get involved in this you know you adhere to a lot of those things and I think Caleb fell in the same kind of situation with the kinetic rope he was used because I I feel that. Uh, uh, that particular brand, you know, told him that a one inch rope was the the size of diameter of kinetic rope he should have used in that scenario, which was clearly overkill because the larger the diameter of rope, the more force it's going to take to get that rope to stretch. And clearly we can see from that video, it didn't stretch, right? So it's also the marketing. So it's also the marketing capability of the brands that you're buying from. So I, I think that a lot of it really goes into you know, for people to do their research and to look at it that, that as, uh, you know, where they want to put, um, you know, the, their, their safety, right. And potentially like, uh, their lives, uh, in, uh, the hands of what, of the, the, the products that they're purchasing. Well, and it goes back, like we've talked about, we talked about in lift kits where we talked about quality and quantity, you know, determining the price. It's always seems to be two things and here, you know, with recovery gear, it is extremely important to get the right gear um, and to use the right gear. Um, you know, like you said with, you know, okay, that, that soft shackle got that RV out. Yeah, it broke, but it got the RV out and it performed even when it wasn't supposed to, like it shouldn't have done that. And different equipment in the same circumstance are probably going to have a different outcome. Just like with this Bronco incident, different equipment probably would have given a different outcome. So, you know, that's, that is definitely a part of it, getting the right equipment, but, and and the second part of it, which would be five more episodes, and and we definitely can't get that much into it, is not only buying the right equipment, but using it in the proper way, um, because that is, man, that is that is so important. Because you know, I don't I don't hear stories about people going out and going to their local wheeling thing and they get hurt just just wheeling. What I do hear is stories about improper recoveries. Um, and, and people, and I don't know why, I mean, I do know why people, you know, it's not something people think about putting the money in because they think more about, well, I'm going to put more money in the tires. I'm going to put more money in the lift. I'm going to put more money in the lights. I'm going to, and I'm just going to go buy this recovery equipment. And that's well, what happens. And well, Doug, I, I think, think that's what you're as, seeing. I think along those perfect lines is something that I touched on in Caleb's interview with Mad Matt in Australia. And it really becomes to a cultural difference of, of what we do as off-roaders here in America. And the biggest thing is that winching is viewed by our standpoint of giving up. Like we, we threw in the towel. Like we didn't drive the obstacle and be like, I mean, how many times, dude, every one of us has experienced to be like, oh, yeah, man, we wheeled X, Y, and Z and be like, oh, yeah, but you pulled cable. And it's like this <laughs> shaming 
situation, right? (laughs) right? And that's, dude, and that's a cultural thing. I mean, like, dude, look at, look at this, look at King of the Hammers, right? King of the Hammers is a perfect example, but the last three years has been decided by who winched the best. And you're not thinking about the fact that that, that is important, right? You want to make up seconds in the desert, but lose it in the rocks because you're, you didn't hit, you didn't hook up the winch line properly. How many times can you, can we talk about it? How many times can we preach about it? Right. And, and really it's the effectiveness of the tools and how to use utilize them in the most effective way ends up with the best outcome. Right. That's why I always talk about how education is our biggest asset off road. And that was a, one of the biggest things of why not only, I mean, dude, there's a lot of companies in a, plenty of USA quality brands that you can buy product from, not just ours. Right. But one of the key things that we set up as the difference there too, was also with releasing these two booklets, Right, our basic guide to winching and our basic guide to kinetic energy recovery and towing a disabled vehicle off road. Right, we put these manuals out awesome there stuff. as educational information to say, like, look, man, here are the here are the critical basic things to understand that can help make your experience in the backcountry better. And honestly, dude, I think it really comes into this whole thing where it, you know it's tough when you get to that level where you know you're V eight swapping your rig and you got big tires and you got all these things. Right, there's this whole capability and most of the time too the the vehicles are now way more capable than the actual drivers that are driving them right there's so much there's so much more technology that's built into these vehicles and that's what's allowing the newbie watching the new toyota ad or the new jeep ad go out and buy this vehicle and be like well it did it in the commercial Mm -hmm. right i mean dude i just saw it even when the super bowl happened right you're seeing all the people ripping around dunes and doing these things and it's cool and it's exciting and it's all these things but that also leads those person to take that thing in the backcountry and get themselves stuck without taking any mm-hmm. kind of experience yep. uh, uh, or a class or, or, or talking to like their local Jeep club or whatever it is before they go out and try to tackle something uh, and to learn. And look, dude, I was that guy. I started there. I did that. You know what I mean? I went from the whole mild to wild type of situation. And so I know because I was victim of doing this and I continued just to try to, you know, to, to uh, hammer home that educational standpoint, like, look, man, you can get it. You can do, you can actually get away doing a lot with bad equipment. You really mm. can. Right. I mean, end of the day, but I mean, have really, you watched dude, an ultra four race? Is it, yeah. Yeah. But I was like, <laughs> but is it, but at the end of the day, right. Is it worth it? You know yeah. what I mean? Is it really worth no, it? Is it worth the safety? No. Is it worth no. sleeping in the woods because you couldn't mm. get off the trail? Is it worth Right, because when when does a recovery always happen? When it's raining yep. and it's dark and it's snowing <laughs> and it's the, the, you know what I mean. You don't have any food. In the morning, and, right? The yeah, man. <laughs> so I think that there's so much more that goes into that for hands-on thing about you know and and to empower to everybody else out there to like go to your local meetups, go to your local Jeep clubs, go to your you know look for your local off-road trainer guy, uh, even the person that may not be the most educated in the space. Uh, you can still learn something from. Use the equipment, right? I mean, like I said before, I put my winch on my Jeep, pulled the thing out and s- snapped it to the cable and was like, I'm badass and I can do whatever. <laughs> Dude, I don't know how to use the thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? I had no idea, right? <laughs> and now to think about the going from uh, education. Now it's be- yeah, and it's become my obsession to it is just purely based off of the need for education and, and to be better yeah. and safer, especially when I'm Absolutely. When I have my Absolutely. my family, my daughter or my wife mm-hmm. with me on the trail or any of my friends. Right. right? And something right. I think is is pretty cool to think about. And Doug and I have kind of touched about this because I had mentioned uh, recommending people to go out to their local group and try to be educated on lift kits, tires, ride in a couple of different Jeeps. Um, I think something that plagues our, I guess, society as a whole, but especially the offered industry now is that even as young as I am, I still grow up, I grew up and got into Jeeps before Amazon was really a thing to buy, you know, Jeep parts off of. Um, I had to go down to the local four wheel drive shop and ask questions. I had to get on pirate form and get flamed. I had to, I had to seek out these people that, that were actually very knowledgeable. <laughs> I had to go and find these people and have a face to face conversation. Whereas now it's just so easy for someone just to comment on a Facebook group and say, Hey, I bought this off of Amazon. It's fine. It looks great. It does. It, I used it one time and it didn't break. It's great. It's fine. Um, that's why, why we're, here. we're here. And, uh, and like Justin said, man, it is not worth your life, your family's life, your kid's life to cheap out on those sort of things. Um, and especially there, there are some things you can save some money on for sure. But this in particular is one area I absolutely do not 
Um, and which is why I think uh, Factor 55 products are so great. We've, we've kind of touched on all these points that back up our, our reasoning for pushing them as a brand and as four wheel drive shops who are trying to be the educational resource for these people. Um, but through those great products, you actually got the attention of another really great product and great brand in this industry. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, it's pretty funny, man. Like, uh, um, it was, uh, it was almost four years ago to the day that, uh, Warren industries actually acquired factor 55. And part of that, uh, really came into, you know, I think that there was, um, a lot of growth. Uh, I think, you know, we, we had, uh, won, um, over 23 new product awards, uh, from the SEMA show over the last, you know, 10 years, uh, for new products that we were constantly developing and, um, still even are still currently developing. Um, and, you know, I think that it just got to a place where like, you know, I kind of knew even from the get go that Mike would have, was always interested in, uh, potentially like, uh, selling the company. And so really at some point it ended up being, um, you know, it ended up being like a lot of people were starting to cater around and try to court the brand. Right. And Mike would just kill the deal every single time. We had a lot of guys that would st stop by and want to talk to us about it and, and uh, be interested in what we were doing because of uh, the patents that we held um, and still held. Right. I mean, that was one of the biggest things where we also don't have design patents. We have utility patents. It's actually functionality of the parts that we uh, invented and developed, uh, which really separated us from the fray, right? As we continue to develop these things and create these patents, um, that is also a big deal for other companies like looking to acquire a business. Uh, Warren had um, tried um, to do some other stuff in the accessory space. Uh, as we all know, most winch brands in general do not have, um, I will, I'll say this, most winch brands in general don't actually manufacture their winches like in-house the way that Warren does. Um, and most companies uh, are not pushing innovation, those standards, the way that we did and the way that Warren does. And so uh, Warren tried to, uh, you know, they had some products that were kind of skirting along the edges of our uh, patent claims and those kinds of things that were not uh, really all that successful for them. And it really kind of got into like, well, if you can't beat them, you buy them. So <laughs> here, yeah. uh, here it is, you know what I mean? And, and really, you know, even for like a lot of the off-road trainers and like some of the recovery experts that we've dealt with for years and in, 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 uh, through different facets of the industry. You know, a lot of them have also said too, like this is the first time ever that a, a winch brand actually now has really good quality accessories, right? You don't have to go somewhere else to do that. You can get all in under one roof. Um, and, and it's some fascinating things that kind of happened there. Like we gave, um, you know, we, we also had a list of over a hundred new products that we had even yet to develop. Uh, once we got acquired by Warren. So there's, so part of it was not only just the patents that already existed, um, the products that we were already putting in the space, uh, it, you know, where we were at as far as like, uh, you know, as trying to push our industry in a safer and better direction. But it was also the fact that we still have so much more to come. Guys, like it's, I can't even tell you, there's so much stuff that's still teed up uh, that is going to be, um, you know, the next big, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I feel the next big innovations that have yet to even be uh, released in the space. Well, I will say it's been pretty, pretty cool. You know, I've seen a lot, especially since COVID, a lot of companies buy other companies or this company take over that company, but to know as much about Warren and the people at Warren that I did before that happened and to know the people at factor 55 before that happened, I don't know that I've seen a better match of you know, a lot, so many times somebody gets bought and it's just like, oh, if somebody got bought, now they're going to hell in a handbasket. Like, it's just going to happen. Um, I don't, I have not seen that happen, like, at all. Like, there has been zero drop off. In fact, I think I've seen Factor 55 expand because of its relationship now with Warren. And you just don't see that very often. So, man, what a, I think just the partnership there was, I I guess it was the deal Michael yeah, I mean, was waiting for him. Yeah, I'm <laughs> it into, yeah, I do it. Great. Into, and then the work, you know, and then look, man, I get to, you know, now I get to work with like, you know, 75 years of business with these guys. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. you know, the, they, and I mean, awesome. Arthur Warren invented the locking mm -hmm. hub, right. They invented the first electric winch. Um, you know what I mean? All of these things it's, you know, to, to now have that all encompassing to be there. Like we really can, 
honestly thank Warren Industries, the fact that we're recreating off road. I mean, you know what yeah. I mean? Like they're they to made, a large you know, extent. You're right. Yeah, you know, they made locking hubs and made four wheel drive possible. They made uh, you know they made uh, electric winches to get our vehicles unstuck and have just been there forever. And to and the team there and the amount of people that are still have been working there for twenty and thirty plus years and the amount of uh, passion and energy that's in that space and 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 the fact that like dude there was so many things about them I didn't even know and uh, you know if you ever get a chance to get to Portland to actually go see the plant. Uh, and see winches being built. I mean, we're talking about broaching machines that are just hogging out raw material to make the gears and building and assembling these winches in this thing. And the amount of stuff that's going on there is it's fascinating. You know what I mean? And the, and in fact, it's all happening right there in Clackamas, Oregon is, is pretty amazing. And so they just, it goes on the same thing where, you know, we, uh, you know, for a large company like that too, like how else are you going to expand and not only your sales, but also your manufacturing capabilities. And that's how you, you know, you start, you know, acquiring other businesses. And that's why they got us. Like we now machine parts and do stuff for them as well. Um, and uh, the same thing when, when they bought Fab Tech uh, and Fab Fours, because now those manufacturers is being U.S. based and U.S. manufacturing um, uh, companies can now make worn product in those facilities and also be all, you know, together and be U- uh, USA made whole brand so it's it's really yeah. cool man it's a match they're, made they're fantastic well, yeah. not only totally. that but uh i mean warren was also an early sponsor of king of the hammers too i think they were one of the first sponsors that picked up along with like one of the very first yeah a few others arb we were yeah. um yeah we were talking about that where chad um chad was at king of the hammers uh the very first year i think with a 16 foot trailer was there like just parked out in the middle of nowhere, you know, doing that. And, and like, sure they showed up with a friggin' dude, semi. Yeah, yeah. Now we got a semi truck, so now it's like a little bit. Things are getting a little more luxurious around here. You know, to I mean? make the show, the show, the show season go easier for us. But it's been a, uh, but yeah. But I mean, you can see just from the growth from where it started uh, and where it's going to go, and still what we have yet to do is uh, pretty amazing, right? So there's still just nothing um, but to grow here, especially with a ton of the. You know, I can't even say it again, the guys, the, the new stuff we have coming, not only just from us, but also from Warren, uh, is going to be really epic. It's going to be really, really I'm cool. excited to see it now. So we're going to do this interview again in a year, and Justin's <laughs> going to tell us about all the products that have rolled out in the last yeah. year. Yeah, exactly. got it. Yeah. On the schedule. Now, are any of yeah. those products being tested at King of the Hammers now? Some of them have been, actually. In fact, this year, um, so uh, Doug has also used them um, as well. Uh, part, of the, part of the R&D process for some of the components that we have created was by using them in the, in the, in the race car world uh, and learning how those parts would be adapted in there. I mean, the same thing with the ultra hook just to begin with, right? Ultra four ultra hook. That's where we got the name from. So um, the new hammer loop, the new hammer strap, those are brand new products that we had made. And that was off of from racing uh, KOH last year uh, was realizing as we are in like outer limits or trying to do all these winching, uh, you know, scenarios in, in the parking lot traffic that we were in, it was allowed me to go out there and, and really put hands on and go, oh, you know what would be great if I had X, Y, and Z. And uh, so that's going to be a lot of those things are now being um, added into uh, the features benefits of these new parts. Um, so, yeah, man, absolutely. Like those new products. So, and we'll de- be doing a whole deep dive in the videos of why and what those things are useful for and, and all of that. I mean, it's going to be it, – it's pretty awesome. I can't wait to see it. No, I can tell you the R&D is legit. Because I remember sitting there with Justin at KOH, I think two years ago, and he's weaving this piece of rope together <laughs> out of old rope. And he's like, I got this really good idea, and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to attach it. I think it was on 4642. And he's like, and like when the name came, I was like, I think we're going to call it the hammer loop. And, you know, here we are two years on, and now it's an actual product. It's been tested. Uh, I can certainly attest that it has been destructively tested. We've used it. Man, I can't tell you how many times we've used the hammer loop. It's, we will not race without that hammer loop attached to the front of 4699 because it just, it filled a need so well um, that we just, it's like, I don't even know how we raced right. before. Yeah, and a lot so of it too. Really, yeah, really happy it, to see that come into the market. A, a lot of it came into, you know, like, it, you know, for necessity purposes. I mean, we were being asked, yep. uh, you know, JT Taylor had initially had called me and said, hey man, can we get a hook throat opening that'll snap over two inch DOM? 
And the problem with that, it was like with any, with any hook, right. With any hook, with that throat opening has to get so wide and so big yeah. in order to be able to have the, to have the latch gate, um, be open so it can grab over something, something that big of diameter. And so one of the things that, you know, in, in the development of the idea of this was to also to say like, uh, uh, if we attach this on here and do this, that all of a sudden now you can wrap it around the axle housing, right? Now you can just, you know, I mean, it's going to get around something, snap into the hook and snap mm-hmm. open. And you don't even have to deal with trying to fit it into the ends of straps or doing all these things. And it's actually still breaks stronger than the winch line itself that it's attached to. And so that's one of the biggest, I think, key components there is that the rope is always the, you know, the single winch line is always the fuse. And that's the thing that you want to fail. If something's going to break. That's what you want to have yeah. let go. You don't yes. want, you want 100%. the rigging yeah. to stay attached to whatever's going to stay attached to. Uh, just again, just like in Caleb's situation, right? The soft shackle failed. And that's what allowed all that energy and that rope to come back yep. up that vehicle. And if you slow it down and you really look at it, what's crazy is the soft shackle broke a- around the knot, right? The knot, yeah. So yeah, I saw this, that. that noose here, once this gets under load, it'll start to roll this back and it shears this around the knot. And that is typical of all soft shackles that we've even seen from our destructive testing. And so that's why I know that that's, it's the soft shackle that failed. And it wasn't the fact that it got cut, that it got cut on a bumper tab because it was, it was not cut that way. I'm glad you said that because I think everybody thought it did get cut. And um, I even thought that at one point um, that it got cut. And then I heard you say that and I'm like, Oh no, that makes way more sense. Seeing the way that that had broke that it really was not, everybody just assumed that it was, well, you put a soft shackle on a recovery point that was made for a, you know, a steel shackle. No, yeah, dude, it was just, it was the actual dude, fibers it was the that act- failed. It was, it was the actual soft shackle that broke. And that's the thing mm-hmm. I think that it's so fascinating to continue to like uh, deep dive into that, right? You're talking about the force applied to the rope. Yeah, they hit it too hard. Yes, they went too fast. Yes, the gear was oversized for the vehicles that were doing the pull. I mean, all of those things, right? Yes, the vehicle was mired too much on the other end. But at the end of the day, man, it was still a bad piece of equipment that let go, yep. right? And yep. that caused uh, this, you know, potential life-threatening scenario that he was in. And so part of the whole thing is it when, when it comes to the racing now, when you're when you're in the backcountry and you are uh, doing a vehicle recovery, and I'm going to just use the manual again for a reference here, in the back of every single one of these manuals, right? Not only do we have like descriptions and show like different. Uh, you know, graphs and scenarios of how to utilize your winch. But there's also, um, uh, there's also the STAPA, which is the Stuck Assessment Checklist, right? Stop, think, observe, plan, and act. And this whole checklist that's in the back of both of the manuals here will go over top of all kinds of different scenarios of what to do, give you your mired tire depth calculation so you can start to factor in the amount of forces that it's going to take to extract the vehicle, Right, and do some just quick off the cuff calculations so you know, like, where for the most part, like, dude, when you're gonna even get a 10 or 12,000 pound winch, if the vehicle is mired to the frame, there's no use in doing a single line pull. Like, what are you doing? Get the, get the snatch block out, get the pulley block out, don't be lazy, just set the thing up and get it, you know what I mean? Because all you're gonna do is you're just wasting effort, mm-hmm. right? The winch is gonna pull its hardest with the least amount of rope around the drum. Yep, you're gonna have. You're going to want to like try to get some type of mechanical advantage and that's going to have a better scenario and situation for for you to get your vehicle unstuck rather than just wasting time walking back and forth between the two vehicles. Now you take some of this simple fundamental basis and then you amplify it to when it's like, go, 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 go. Right now we're racing. Uh, Everybody's everywhere. You got a helmet on, you got gloves on and you don't know what you're doing and adrenaline's pumping and it's all these things. Now, how are you to be safe when you're actually forced to rush, right? And so that gets one of the big key things when it comes into the R&D and the product development end to where we're going to build those safety factors in there to make sure that the equipment is reliable, to make sure that you can have a degree of error because there's always going to be error when it comes to using it in a fast and a racing scenario. So we want to minimize those risks even as much as possible so that way you have the, the best outcome even in that scenario. And if it's going to work in that environment, in that heated, fast pace area, it's for sure going to work if you're just going to pump the brakes, go slow, talk about what needs to be done, and set the whole thing up and and get off the trail yeah. safely. Well, very well, well said. 100% well, I uh, 
I think we're running a little bit short on time here because we don't have time to do this today, but I would love to do another episode, Justin, with you, if you, uh, if you're up to it, maybe a, uh, maybe a shorter, one of our shorter episodes of what are the, you know, the top, we'll call it five things that you need to have in your recovery bag. Oh yeah. Uh, That's an episode. We got to, because I think a lot of people like you you just mentioned a couple of things that I think a lot of new Jeepers are like, what's a snatch block? What's this? What's the tree strap? And they just, they have a cheap winch in the front and a hook and that's all they know. Uh, so keep that on mind, but uh, I think we don't, don't think we have time for it today. Yeah, I mean, because how we'll do that in the future for sure? Yeah, yeah, because you know how many times uh, I can't tell you how many times we've gotten on these trail rides and people are like, yeah, man, I got the winch up there. I never used it though. <laughs> yeah. Like that's some kind <laughs> of else. badge of yeah. honor. <laughs> like, bro, then, then clearly you're not wheeling hard right. enough. You know what I mean? Like the winch is a tool, and it's like the same thing when it gets back to this whole shaming thing. Like, oh, well, you used your winch. Well, you used your lockers cool guy <laughs> boom <laughs> got him you know what i mean like it's just a tool you know what i'm saying yeah. it's just a tool to to get from a to b and like like dude i was if we're going across the sahara or the you know or trying to traverse africa right we got to winch up these waterfalls to get to the destination it's it, it's just a tool to get yeah, to the end absolutely you know what i mean yep. and there's and it's cool to know when and how i mean it's just like dude with driving technique it's cool to start learning how to do two-footed driving it's cool to know where uh, the, you know, how the geometry of your suspension works. It's cool to know about how your shocks are going to respond to the rebound and compression and the dampening that goes into there. And it's cool to understand how to use your equipment so you have the tools to be the hero in that situation, especially every recovery class that we teach. Every time we talk about it, we always refer to the 80-20 rule. And 80% of the time, you are going to use this equipment to help somebody else and not yourself. So why don't you, you need to be the asset and not the liability. Be the, be the hero. It's yeah. cool. It is cool. It is cool. Well, I can, I can definitely attest to that. I mean, I've definitely recovered myself plenty of times, especially like you say in racing. I mean, but if it can work in racing situations, yeah, a hundred percent. And to have that, to have that, the proper equipment, and then more importantly to know how to properly use it. Um, man, that is, that's absolutely huge. And why not, why not learn and know how to use it? Cause I guarantee you, the more you get out there and the more you do this stuff, the more you're going to need to use it. And there is a serious lack of knowledge out there and a lack of education. And why not be that person who can be that, uh, that experienced individual and be able to relay some of that information because you, you, know, you perked up Absolutely. and paid attention. Yeah. Why not, man, that was awesome. <laughs> that was good stuff. <laughs> I, um, and we even have an idea for another episode right. we're going to do. So Justin, man, thank you so much. Uh, for coming for on sure. and talking about it today. I know we covered a lot. Um, it was it was stuff that needed to be covered. If we did this five times more, we could cover. I'm sure we could do it without even covering the same mm-hmm. stuff. Again. Oh, yeah. So, and, and for yeah anybody thank listening, you so much for coming on. Yeah. And thank you guys so much. And for anybody listening, if you, you, know, you ever want to get into the deep dives of the numbers, you want to get into minimum breaking strengths or elongation of materials and, all, and whatever, whatever it is, we are completely transparent about the data that we have, what we do how we develop the products, the FEA analysis that we put into every part that we develop. You know, we are, we're more than happy to share that uh, information. And you can always just give us a call, DM us on any of our social profiles, whatever. And we'll be happy to walk you through equipment that'll work with your rig uh, or, or anything. Whatever your needs are, we're always here to help. That's awesome. Love it. Absolutely love it. Well, that is where we are going to wrap it up today. Um, absolutely great episode. Tons of great information. Uh, we, while, we also, while we do appreciate Justin coming out, we also appreciate each and every one of you watching and listening at home, in your vehicles, wherever you may be. And please remember, so that we can keep doing this. We like doing this. We want to bring more of it. Uh, remember to like. Remember to comment. Remember to subscribe. Leave the reviews on the Apple Podcast. Comment it up on the YouTube feed. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you'd like to see more of. Maybe what you'd like to see less of, except my face. Sorry, guys. I'm still going to be here. Uh, it's just going to happen, guys. I'm sorry. It's a necessary. You got to take the bad with the good. Um, but, yeah, definitely leave us those ratings. Make sure that uh, we are able to provide this to as many people as possible for as long as possible. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, guys, thank you both for being here. It was awesome. It was fun. Can't wait to do it again. Um, for everybody, uh, make sure you subscribe. You're going to get the mailbag on Friday. Maybe we'll get some cool recovery questions in the meantime. Uh, you know, and, and we'll, we'll be absolutely looking out for that. So thank you to everyone. Thanks, Mm -hmm. Caleb. Thanks, Justin. Until next time, 
Dirt to Dust, we are out. Thank you, everybody. You've been listening to Dirt to Dust. Presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.